Greetings and welcome to episode 19 of taking apart a Monroe K series calculator, actually putting it back together again. Uh, so I'm Rob. Um, you'll notice some differences. Um, the previous episode actually had uh, a very short intro uh, section that just said 18. Um, and it had some music, which is kind of cool. It's uh, Creative Commons music. So um, I put the link to where you can get that uh, down below. So check it out. Uh, anyway, so this is episode 19. And uh, according to the uh, episodes that we have previously done, um, we are currently working backwards, putting the machine back together again. Uh, we are now uh, working our way backwards through episode 9, which is taking apart the keyboard mechanism. And of course, we will be putting it back together again uh, during this episode. Um, so what I've done is I've laid out all the parts. And um, since there are very many parts, I can't actually get it all in one shot. So I'm just going to do this handheld. Um, and that's why you see me, because I'm doing a little introduction. So let me show you all the parts. So here we go. Here's uh, basically a wide shot of all the parts that go into the keyboard mechanism. So, oops. Yeah, the, um, the microphone is not doing so well. Um, so here we have the plate that all the little keys go into. Um, these are little um, things that go on the sides of the plate. And you can see these little U-shaped indentations. That's where the carriage um, movement axle goes. Um, these things are for locking and clearing the keyboard. Um, these things are um, these sort of bars that go across the plate so that when you press a key, they actually lock the key in. Um, this sort of double axle thing is the mechanism which actually clears the keyboard out. Um, here are a whole bunch of key stems. There's a lot of them. Uh, well, 80 of them, um, because this is an 8x10 keyboard. Here are a bunch of springs, and here are a bunch of um, washers and a couple supports. Um, there's a little thing with a set screw in it. Um, and also these other funny non-round shapes um, are actually key stem locks. Um, so we will, uh, you, you can probably see how it all works in episode nine, but we're probably just gonna do it again, um, explaining it. Now, the reason that these are on napkins is that what I did was I took this stuff, let me put the microphone down, There we go. Um, I took this stuff, industrial maintenance coating thinner, which um, this is a California product. See, it says use in place of MEK, toluene, xylene, and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's all stuff that is not legal to use in California because cancer. Um, I'm sure not that this doesn't cause cancer. I'm sure it does, uh, just like everything else, I, I guess. Um, and here is a bucket and a toothbrush. Um, so basically what I did was I poured some of this into the bucket. Um, and with the toothbrush, I just basically cleaned this plate. Oh, God, was it dirty. Um, all of these larger parts I cleaned with the toothbrush. Um, all of these parts I then dumped into the bucket, poured the um, thinner over it, and then just agitated the, uh, the pail um, for about a minute or so. Uh, and it came out really clean. Um, these especially were, were almost black with um, grease. And all I did was, again, I just dumped it into the pail, agitated it for a minute or two, um, and then pulled them out, and they were nice and shiny. Uh, same deal with these. I mean, these were really gunked up. So anyway, um, that's what I did. And what's left, in fact, let me move the microphone again. What's left is this bag. And in this bag, I'm not going to open it yet, um, are all the pieces of felt. Um, I think there's probably 160 pieces of felt. 
or so, uh, two for each key stem. I also left all of the screws, there's a screw, and all of the springs in here. I didn't want to clean them because they're kind of really small parts and I didn't want them to get lost. So I could probably hand clean them or they may not even need to be cleaned. So those are all the parts that go into the keyboard and now we will put the keyboard back together again. All right, so uh, to put the keyboard back together again, uh, we've got to work backwards. Um, the first thing we've got to do is take the plate and orient it properly. So um, to begin with, what we're going to do is place the plate so that these standoffs are facing up and so that this notch is to the left. Um, next thing that we're going to have to do is um, pick one of these and put them on this side. So the question is, all right, well, is it this one or is it this one? And you can see that they are slightly different. Um, one's got a bigger U than the other one. But the, the way you figure it out is that you can see that there are these pins um, on the end and they, when they're put onto the plate, face inward. And the reason for that is that these bars have little holes on the end and the holes go on the pins like this so that these can rock back and forth. And the only way for that to happen is if the pins are facing each other. So there's no pin on the other side. Um, that means that, and the U must go on the right side. So that means that there's only one of these that can possibly fit so that the pins are facing in and that the U is on the side and that is this one because this obviously isn't going to do it. So what you do is you have these alignment pins and you have these holes for screws. And you simply put that in. And it just goes in like that. Now, the next thing that you have to do is apply some screws so that we can attach this to the plate. So we have, um, I've, I've taken the, um, the uh, felt out of the bag um, along with the smaller parts. Um, we have 10 springs, they all look approximately the same. One is slightly smaller, but I'm not sure that that matters. Um, and then we have six small screws and two large screws. So the first thing we're gonna do is, on the plate, we have basically four screw holes. We're going to screw uh, the middle two using small screws. So let's do that now. I'm just gonna take this. Put it in there, It's one, there's two. And some of the small screws are slightly smaller than the others, but again, I think that's just because um, the exact size doesn't really matter. And um, it doesn't look like they were any good at making um, precise, precisely sized um, screws Anyway, aside from their threads, which of course they had to get right. Uh, so I'm just screwing this in. There's one screw. This is a magnetized tip, so sometimes it just sort of hangs in. Okay, so there we go. All right, now for this, we have these um, side pieces and these side pieces hold this in place and this is the zeroing mechanism. So let's see how we put that piece on. Um, so first of all, it's important to orient this piece the right way. So it looks like this is going to go, uh, I'm looking at the video right now and I'm trying to see, I'm pretty sure, uh-huh. Okay, so this is actually gonna go like this with the lever on the side opposite the notch, like that. And we have, um, this bushing which goes over here and that'll eventually hold it in place. So 
Um, the next thing is uh, these things. So you can see that there is a long hole and a round hole. And the long hole is for the pin. Um, so obviously, it will either go like this or like this. So we have to figure out which it is. So in other words, this is either going to be held off the board or it's going to be held on the board. So I'm just going to very quickly consult the video and it looks like it is actually held off the board like that. Um, and uh, in fact, I think I may be incorrect. I think this may actually go, let me just orient this the way the video is showing. So it looks like it's like this. Oh, okay, I'm just holding it up like this, right? No. There we go, <laughs> okay. I got it oriented the way the video is showing. I think that's correct, yes. Um, now, according to this, it looks like we're holding this up like this. So actually, that's right, okay. This lever is on the same side as the notch. And the reason for that is that there is a spring that goes from this hole in the lever to this hole on the edge of the plate. So that's why this goes like this. Um, and then it is actually held off the board, which means that when I put these on, they basically have to go like that, just like that. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, let's see. Can I, uh, if I were to, I'm just planning this out a bit. Um, yeah. Right, okay, so um, I'm trying to figure out whether to screw these in first. Well, it, it, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm gonna screw in um, this one using the long screws, right? Because we're moving through more material and that's why two of the screws are longer. So I'm just going to screw the one bushing into place. Great. It's kind of odd the way, um, the way that this hole is elongated because that sort of implies that this thing could move back and forth. But of course it can't because that screw fixes it in place. So I'm not really sure what the deal is on that. Um, okay, so then we will put this other one. Now if I do that, the question is can I get this in? Probably. I don't want to put the axle in first because then I won't be able to put the screw in because the axle is in the way and that's no good. So again using a long screw simply going to put the bushing in its location on the other side of the plate, screwing it in with the long screw. Okay, so there we go. So now I take the axle and on the long end, I'm going to insert that over on the left side Okay, now I can just insert it on the right side all the way, basically, or almost all the way. Because the next step is we're going to take this uh, bushing with the set screw and we're going to, does the set screw go inside or outside? It actually goes inside. Okay, so I, I didn't do this correctly. Um, the bushing goes on first. Uh, actually, let me put some oil on that. I refilled my oil container. So let me just put some oil on that so that it's easy to go on. 
and so that it doesn't, I don't know, rust in place or something. Um, okay. So I'm going to put that right on there. Nice. Um, I'm also going to just put a drop of oil on each, on the inner side of these surfaces and maybe a little bit over here because this is actually going to be a moving part. So, all right. So now I just put the long end in, put the short end in. Now I move the axle, the um, bushing over like that to fix it in place. See, it doesn't move. Um, now because these two surfaces are touching and they're going to be moving, I'm going to put some oil on there as well. Okay. And the same thing on this surface. Okay. Great. Now I'm going to take my screwdriver and holding the axle in position, I'm going to tighten the set screw. Set screw is tightened and there it is. Okay, just distributing the oil a bit. And there we go. Okay. It's not, um, it doesn't move completely freely. There is obviously friction. You can see that it is holding its own weight. Um, but I don't think that's too important. All right, um, I can put the spring on now. Um, I'll just use the spring that's small. So the spring will go on one end. So these are, these are hook end springs, they're called hook end. Um, the reason is that, of course, it's a spring and it's got a hook on the end. Um, so you gotta put the hook into the hole without actually distorting the hook. So there's one. And then over here, I'm just gonna put that in there. Get it in to the hole. There we go. So that's how that works. Okay. Now you can see how the zeroing mechanism now works because um, we have two different types of key stems. One is a zero key and the other is one through nine. The zero key stem would of course fit in like this. See? so that this tab sticks out. And obviously when I pull on this axle, it's gonna pull on that key stem. If the key stem were you know, perfectly straight up and down, which of course it's not constrained to at this point. Um, it will be when we put it um, in the casing, of course, but for now, that's basically how that would work. So this would pull the zero key down as if you were pressing it. Next thing that we're gonna do is we will turn the plate upside down. So we have this rail over here um, and on the rail are eight little holes. And those holes are for springs, these guys. Um, so we have nine springs left. We're just gonna separate off eight of them. Again, they're the same size or approximately the same size. So we can just pick any one. And what we're going to do is place the screws so that they are hooked in and they basically just hang right over there. And these springs are specifically for these little bars here. And the other end of the, of the spring goes into this hole. And then, um, or is it this way? Yeah, it's this way, um, I'm pretty sure. So if I put one of these in place, get in there. Okay, and imagine that it's held on the other side. So this spring is gonna go over here and it's basically gonna hold this bar into place and the, the bar can, move, can rotate this way and the spring will pull it back this way. And the reason for that is that the, um, the key stems have these funny little cutouts over here 
and when the cutouts are, um, I think I would have to put this stem through one of the holes. Let me do that. Like that. Okay. So you can see that that if I push the key down now, it's kind of hard to see, but if I push the key down, right, that will pull, that will rotate the bar and then the bar will snap back into place due to the action of the spring. And then this is now pressed down in place. In order to clear all the keys, basically what you would have to do is have a bar running the full length, pushing all of these rock bars like this, whereupon this can spring back up. And then you release it and it just goes like that and then you can press this down again like that. Um, so that's basically how the keyboard works. Um, here's the spring that goes onto the key stem that, that um, forces, it, forces it up when the bar is released and then it springs back up. So that's basically how it works. Um, so let me take these out again. Um, so that's why we have these eight springs because there is one of these bars for, there is a bar for each row. So I'm just gonna put these springs on. Um, I thought I might be able to do this by hand, but I guess not. So again, these are hook ends. So I'm just gonna take the spring and hook it over the end. In terms of whether it gets hooked on like this or like this, it doesn't really matter because it'll just stay in there in the end. So you can just do it whatever way is most convenient for you. Again, pulling gently, pulling just enough to get the hook over and into the hole without actually um, bending the hook. So here's spring number three. I'm just gonna pull it slightly and then put it into its hole. Oops, totally lost the hole. There we go. Number three. Number four. Number five. And I'm doing this first rather than after all the key stems are in because you can see that it's a lot easier to put the springs in before all the key stems are actually sticking up here and getting in the way. So. Now, one thing that occurred to me is that after I cleaned all of these metal parts, I did not apply anything that would prevent rust. And I'm not sure if that's a mistake or not. Clearly, on all the moving parts, I put some oil on there. So that's obviously going to help. But, you know, in terms of the, the surfaces and the non-moving parts, um, I don't know. I mean, um, I heard bad things about WD-40, so I'm certainly not going to use that. Um, there is, um, Crud Cutter makes a, uh, a de-rusting liquid or stuff that is supposed to simultaneously remove rust and protect the metal against rust. Um, I don't know. So I'm just going to leave it like this and kind of... Um, hope for the best. Um, besides, in 30 years, the singularity is going to happen, and you know we won't be around to take apart these calculators. So nobody is actually going. So there's not going to be enough time for this thing to rust. Um, 2045 is when the singularity happens, and we'll all upload and have a great time. So um, anyway, uh, okay. So that's that. 
So the next step is we need to put the key stems on. So uh, we'll start with the zero key stems. Um, and what I want to do is basically put the key stem in here from the bottom, right? So it goes in like that. Um, and I'm not certain whether I have to put a washer with a piece of felt in there. Here's a washer. Here's a piece of felt. I think I do. And that goes in like that. Well, obviously it would have to go in. Let me just check the video to see if, um, if we do get washer and felt on the under, underside. The reason that we would put a uh, washer and felt is, um, for example, for this key stem, right, which definitely takes one of these. So we put a washer first, then a piece of felt, and that goes in like this. Okay. So when the key gets pressed down, this happens, but then the key, and there's a spring on the other side, so that when the key gets released, it smacks into the plate. And obviously you don't want that smacking sound to be very harsh and metallic, which is why they put this felt over here. So they would do that, and then on this side they actually have a spring. Okay, and then this thing, this little piece, actually fits into this notch over here, this little slot, and holds this in along with another washer. So that's how the spring gets held on. So basically you do that for all the keys except possibly for the zero key. So I'm going to check the video on that and then I'll come back. All right, so I checked the video and indeed, at least according to the video, which I believe, um, each one of the zeros does take a washer and a piece of felt. So it's um, difficult to put the washer and felt on first, like this, and then stick this in because the washer just sort of gets in the way. Um, also, um, you can see that um, it's good to put the zero key stems in first because that tells you the orientation of the notches. Um, because if this were oriented like this, then this little tab would not be able to hit the axle, which means that the notches must go like this. So, uh, what I'm going to do, I guess, is I'm going to um, let's see can I swing this out of the way no because if I swing it out of the way I'll never be able to swing it back so so basically I'm just going to put the washer and felt just on the plate and then move it in place that's it that's all I have to do and then I have to uh, pull on it a little bit. Why isn't it going in? It's stuck on something? I think it's stuck on something. There we go. Okay. So basically, that's this side. And then on this side, I'll turn the plate around like this. Uh, the first thing you need to do is put on a spring. So here's a spring. You just put it on like that. And this will work for all the other um, things as well. The next thing that you need to do is take a washer. And you just put it on. And the final thing we do is take one of these locking things. Um, and you take pliers. And you hold on to the locking bit. And we're going to, let's see, how can I orient this? I guess, I guess that's okay. And what you have to do is push down on the washer, stick the thing inside, which is kind of difficult, but it can be done without dropping anything. 
So once you get one or two of these done, you kind of get the hang of it, and then you can do the rest of it pretty pretty quickly. So, so you just sort of jam it in there, and it locks in place like that. See? That's how it works. Now, of course, because this key has freedom to move like this, it's not going to move very smoothly unless it's perfectly straight up and down. And that happens when the top plate gets put on. So, anyway. Um, okay, so I think it's time for a time lapse.
for closing time. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to stop here. And the reason that I'm going to do that is, first of all, you can see that we've pretty much run out of felts. Um, we have uh, four, probably seven left, and we obviously need 12. So number one, we're missing five. And number two, these are the worst felts that there are. Um, some of them are just ripped. Some of them have been flattened out and distorted. So uh, I'm just gonna, you know, like go to a craft store or something and get some more uh, brown felt and then cut it into a circle and then just cut a slot into it somehow. Um, so that's the easy part. Um, one thing that I did notice as I put this together, and it's, I'm not sure if you can actually see this, so I'm going to put, yeah, about like that. So you can see that uh, one of these stems is different than the other. Uh, one of these stems is not the same. So this one on top is actually bent slightly um, and I'm feeling it and I can actually feel the uh, the metal having been distorted right over here now I could bend it back but the problem is that whenever you bend metal you fatigue when you have, whenever you bend metal back and forth you fatigue it so this will be uh, quite fragile um, I think I mentioned a while back um, that I had actually 3D printed one of these. It was actually a, um, a curvy bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get um, another one of these 3D printed um, that's flat um, and just use that instead of this. Um, that's the nice thing about 3D printing. Um, the bad thing about 3D printing is that it's still quite expensive. Um, I don't remember how much I paid for that little piece, but you know, I suspect that this is going to be anywhere between fifteen and thirty dollars. Which, you know, if you think about it, is you know, compared to the cost of uh, one of these things from eBay, is um, it it would be ridiculous to actually. It would not be economical to three D print something like that. But you know, the alternative is to take one of these machines from eBay and use it for parts, um, and basically just say that you're going to basically take one out of circulation. Um, you know, if, if you really wanted that one back into circulation, you would have to replace all of its parts uh, that you pulled off of it. So, you know, in the end, I guess it sort of evens out, but um, yeah, so the point is to 3D print or not to 3D print, uh, or to replace or not to replace. Um, and I would argue in favor of uh, replacing, because if you don't replace, then you're taking one machine out of circulation, at least one. So let's see. Let's just make sure we have all the parts that we think we're supposed to have. So there's five. Well, that's weird. Um, we've got some parts missing. Oh, no, we don't. Sorry. Um, there are eight per row, so there we go, eight and two, so <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and uh, we needed, therefore we needed 10 uh, felts, and we have seven felts here, so we are missing three felts. Um, and in terms of these, um, as I was putting these together, um, I was looking at this small part, really wondering what I should call it. It looks like a t-shirt, so I'm just going to call them t-shirts. <laughs> so um, obviously we need um, 10 t-shirts and 20 washers. So we've got 5 washers, we've got 10 washers, we've got 15 washers, 20 washers, 26 washers. Um, what? Did I count that right? Um, I know we have 10 stems. Oh, yeah. Um, because I didn't put on 
um, the tops of these yet. So that would be 26 washers in total. Um, okay, so that means that in terms of t-shirts, I would need 16 t-shirts. So let's just make sure I have 16 t-shirts. That's four, eight, 16 t-shirts. Good, okay, so uh, I've got all the parts with the exception of the one bent key stem and um, I'm going to replace all of these felts because these are all distorted or ripped. Um, and, oh, and we have springs. Um, I'm just gonna sort of assume that we have the right number of springs because why wouldn't we? Um, we seem to have all of the parts anyway and we were very careful in putting parts back into bags. Um, so uh, that's going to be it for this episode. Um, and when we return next time, we're going to finish the keyboard assembly and uh, I guess that means we're going to move on to the main frame, which is kind of cool. So until next time, this is Rob signing off. See ya.